that is with BioExcel, which is the Centre of Excellence, and we have Open Multimed collaborating with us, which is a cost action across Europe in um, September. Finally, to cap it all this year, we're working on an IMAX event, which will take place in the Science Museum in London in a late event. That'll be an evening event uh, on the 27th of September. That's to show the general public the spectacular kinds of capabilities that come out of high-performance computing coupled to visualisation for the virtual human. Here's the list of partners. You've got leaflets which describe some of this in detail. It's an interesting partnership, in my opinion, because it includes about half of the partners are academic centres. Three of them are uh, European supercomputing centres, a uh, couple of SMEs and uh, major companies such as uh, Janssen and Pharmaceuticals. The associate partnership should be of interest to people who like this kind of work because we're very open to that. We've now got more associate partners than partners themselves and we take this role very seriously. Many of the people who are listed there are participating in this meeting and some of the projects involve them and their resources and capabilities directly and centrally in what we're doing. And so we're open for that in the future. We're always urged to promote ourselves, and if you're into the social media side of things, Twitter, LinkedIn, you've got an opportunity to go online and uh, interact with us through that. This slide just shows you how you can do it today, and I'm sure there will be various postings. If you want to do that, please uh, help us promote what we're about. There's a LinkedIn group as well. Uh, there is also a live recording of this event taking place on YouTube, so you can go to YouTube Comp Biomed and I hope uh, you will be able to see us and the speakers uh, during the day and we'll keep this as a record. So I want to thank Microsoft in particular who are very enthusiastic about uh, the type of work we're doing. They've uh, wanted to sponsor this event and we're delighted that they have done so. So acknowledge that, and actually for academic participants in this, the Azure uh, Cloud um, offering uh, is, is a $500 worth cloud credit for people. And you can get uh, hold of that by talking to Kenji Takeda today. Where is Kenji? You might want to wave. He's right at the back there. Um, to talk to him about it and look at the Azure for Research uh, website. Feedback, you'll get some questions from you, questionnaire from us to fill in before the end of the meeting. We need to understand what your views of this meeting are, how we might improve for the future. We'll have a panel discussion towards the end and we're interested in questions for that. They can be logged live in the event, but if you want to pose them ahead so we get ready for some of the uh, questions, then please let us know. Speakers must remain at the podium. I'm reminding them all because of the the need for this recording and my last slide here is just to emphasize you know it's an open community and it's growing fast and I do believe for reasons I'm not going to elaborate right now this this methodology and technology is the future of medicine and I do think that the European Commission believes centrally in that as well so with that I'll stop and thank you Andy Grant is doing the chair of the first one, session, yeah. so I don't know who the next speaker is. The next speaker is Anna Mencho, who's going to talk to us about HPC for the investigation of the electrophysiological activity of the human heart. That's harder to say than... It's a little bit long. I will give you a five-minute warning. Okay. Can I... Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> no, no, it was, uh, yeah, yeah, it was working and I think it was working. This is a microphone. You have to put it somewhere. So okay. This is a cool thing. Okay. Okay. 
Good morning. Uh, thanks a lot for inviting me. Uh, my name is Anna Minchole. I'm uh, in the Computational Cardiovascular Science Group uh, in the Computer Science Department at the University of Oxford. Uh, I will start by motivating the study of cardiovascular diseases. But uh, something has happened. Uh, okay. Okay, it's okay. 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 it's working. Like um, uh, like the figures talk by themselves. Twenty six percent of all deaths in the United Kingdom and 31% globally are due to cardiovascular diseases, according to the British Heart Foundation. And uh, there are a lot of uh, research going on, on diagnosis of the diseases, mechanisms, but also on therapy. The first line therapy of cardiovascular diseases is uh, antiarrhythmic drugs. However, uh, one of the most malignant side effects of these antiarrhythmic drugs is that they may lead to arrhythmias. So the questions here are why, which are the mechanisms for those arrhythmias, who, under, this under which conditions these arrhythmias can take place, and also when. Those questions uh, are still unclear, we don't know them, and there are many people working on them. We are uh, investigating those questions from the computational medicine disciplines, uh, this aims at developing quantitative approaches for understanding the mechanisms, diagnosis, and treatment of human diseases through computational techniques, but also mathematics, experimental physics, many things. So we work in cardiac modeling. We use a multi-scale integration. We go from ionic currents uh, through single cell tissue organ, going to body uh, level computing the uh, electrophysiology at the body surface level and uh, ending with the simulation of the electrocardiogram. So at ionic level, I'll, let's, okay. at ionic currents, the, uh, the, these currents are model like ODs, then at single cell level, those uh, ionic currents are integrated in an action potential model that represent the electrical activity of a cell. And at these two levels, uh, the investigations of the mechanisms can be done with a PC. However, when you include all this complexity and all these ballet rolls to whole organ, then to torso, and then you want to get to these uh, higher levels of complexity, you need high performance computing and also high performance computing facilities are uh, Archer, that is the one that we are using right now. Why HPC? As we said, at a cellular level, the electrical activity is modeled by a set of ODs. Those ODs depend on the voltage, and this voltage is determined by the solution of a PD. When we embed this into organ, we have to couple the cells, which is done by a PD, and this is influenced by the heart geometry. But how a heart geometry looks like, or which are the... Here we have an example of a tetrahedral mesh of human ventricles coming from a CT scan. The edge length that we were using for simulating electrophysiology is 0.4 millimeters. It contains 2.5 million of nodes, each of them representing a cell. So then a cell model <coughs> is in each of these uh, nodes, and it contains also 14.2 uh, million of elements. If we think that uh, if we are using the latest human single cell model, that is the Harudi model, it contains 40 variables. That means that we are dealing with about 100 uh, million variables, that in double position is 800 millivolts, millibytes, <laughs> and megabytes, <laughs> for one time instant. So, Human cell model, this is an example of an um, action potential model, the electrical activity of a cell. It has, uh, it contains a lot of currents. Here they are 
the most important ones. And we observe that uh, there is a large number of uh, steep ODs. Some of them have rapid behavior, another one slower behavior. So it usually requires a small time steps. And the most important thing for us is uh, the computational power increases. And additionally, one bit, that is approximately 1,000 milliseconds, it contains, uh, if we want to save every one millisecond, we are talking about 1,000 time instants. If we would like to save the information of, of one bit, it would be about 800 gigabytes. So these are big numbers and HPC is necessary for them. Now I'm going to show you three examples in which we were using high performance computing. This is the first uh, <coughs> one. We were interested in understanding mechanisms and this is an um, organ level simulation. In this one, our aim was to investigate uh, and to simulate a heart attack <coughs> and the effect of drug therapy. Uh, a heart attack, in a heart attack normally there is a um, region of the ventricles in which um, uh, it's ischemic, uh, oxygen is uh, not getting to that part of the, of the heart. Here this is the, the area and it's surrounded by a border zone in which uh, the appearance of ectopic activity that uh, triggers a re-entry is uh, higher. So this is our first model and we were um, simulating the effect of these different drug doses to understand, uh, to understand the mechanisms of the arrhythmia in each of the cases. Here we have an example. This is an activation of the ventricles. Then it comes the repolarization that is here. Then it comes another bit, normal bit. This is the repolarization and here it will appear an ectopic activity that will trigger a re-entry. So it surrounds the ischemic area and then gets in. In order to do this kind of sim simulations, we are using a parallelized monodomain model uh, by finite element, tetrahedra with linear interpolation. Uh, this mesh has 2.5 uh, million of nodes uh, with realistic cardiac fiber orientation. The, Action potential model that we were using is the 10 to share model. It's a little bit simpler than the one I commented before, 19 state variables. And we solve it using the implicit power Euler method. Uh, using 1024 processors on the previous supercomputing supercomputer of the United Kingdom Hector, it took uh, about six hours to simulate 800 milliseconds. And what's the discovery after all these things? Well, the, what we observed, we were um, investigating uh, for different simulations. The, we were investigating the wavefronts at whole organ level, and we observed that for high doses of this drug therapy, we were, we were observing a lot of um, transmural reentries. That means that the, the waveform was coming from the endocardium and getting out uh, to the epicardium here. We have the second bit, the, the ectopic activity will come here soon. Here it is. It surrounds the ischemic area and it will, the reentry will come here. And then the arrhythmia is uh, flowing. And here we will observe, like, we see this, that it's going to come from inside, from the endocardium to the epicardium, and we have several transmural reentries. This is what we observe in high doses of this drug therapy. And then, since we, these are multi-scale simulations, we were able to see what is happening in this area at this point, and we were observing this signature of the, of the axion potential. This signature is called uh, early after depolarizations, Normally, they were observed in experiments, but never at whole organ level. And we observe, thanks to all the simulations that uh, electrotonically trigger early after the polarization, there, it was the ones facilitating the transmural reentries near the border zone under condition of high drug doses. Okay, this is another example. This is a body level simulations. In this one, 
we, we were not interested in the mechanisms. We, uh, it was for diagnosis, uh, pro, uh, uh, we, for diagnostics, and what we wanted it was to simulate the ECG. The ECG is the electrical activity of the heart that is measured by some electrodes over the body surface. Uh, in order to do this, we were using a torsion mesh with uh, lungs and ribs on the heart. It was 3.4 uh, million of nodes, 19.4 million of tetrahedral elements. Different <coughs> edge lengths were used, finer resolution in the heart, as imagined, and a much coarser mesh it was for the, for the torso. Uh, 2,048 cores distributed on 128 nodes were used and a simulation of a heartbeat took about 1.5 hours. We were validating this model uh, at a uh, whole organ also using the body surface potential mappings and then the, the ECG. Uh, we already talked about the computational aspects and once we have this model, we were investigating or simulating conduction blocks. These are the most typical ones, left bundle branch block and right bundle branch block. In the left bundle branch block, the left ventricle is not uh, stimulated uh, at the right time, it's a little bit delayed. The same happens uh, with the right bundle branch block in which the right ventricle is stimulated much, uh, uh, it's delayed. So we were simulating, these are the results of our simulations of uh, this pathology. And these are the comparison with the uh, patients diagnosed with this uh, pathology for left uh, bundle branch block and right bundle branch block. As we observe, they are uh, quite similar, so the method is working quite well. And this is the last uh, example I'm going to show you. This is the one we are working on. I mean, up to now, we were using the same torso, the same mesh for different pathologies, for different investigations and here we were uh, going towards personalization of models from um, MRI, magnetic resonance images, to ECG. So in order to do this, this is the pipeline we have developed. Uh, we start with uh, a standard cardiac MRI clinical acquisitions. We construct uh, personalized meshes of heart, torso, lungs, then we assign uh, electrophysiological properties. Uh, we include fiber orientations. Eventually, we are going also to personalize the fiber orientation using DTI that we have for these patients. And we assign an activation sequence. And once we have all this, we are able to uh, simulate electrophysiology at the body surface uh, level and then simulate the, the ECG. So, here we have the first step, that is, here are the typical uh, four chambers view of MRI, two chamber, and short axis from a uh, base to apex. And here we have uh, manual contours uh, of uh, right ventricle, left ventricle, endocardium, also epicardium, and with all this and some image processing, we are able to obtain uh, personalized meshes of the heart of the patients. Also, we were using localizers. The localizers are uh, not so uh, high resolution images that they are taking in advance in order to locate the heart. With these uh, images, we were um, delineating or segmenting uh, different parts of the, of the torso of the patient. This, together with a statistical model and uh, regularization taking into account the height and also the weight of the patient, we were able to personalize also the torso. So this is what we obtain. Uh, the personalized heart and torso and lungs for uh, every individual. Once we do this thing, we need to construct our volumetric meshes, uh, different resolutions, as I explained before, all open for um, 0 0.4 millimeters for, for the heart, and we get to 0.8 centimeters uh, edge length in the torso. And once we do this, we uh, assign the electrophysiological properties as I commented before, and we are able to simulate the electrical activity in the heart and then 
uh, to the torso and from here I'm placing virtual electrodes to the patient who are able to simulate the 12 lead ECG. <coughs> Here is an example, this is the uh, activation of the heart, the QRS, and here it comes, the repolarization, that is the T wave. This is our, our first uh, subject, and uh, this subject uh, contains, I mean, this mesh of the subject contains 44 million of elements, 7 million of nodes, and just the heart uh, on its own, 5.2 million of nodes and 32 million of elements. A simulation of uh, the electrical activity of 500 milliseconds using 960 processors in Archer takes around six hours. Um, sorry, and this is uh, the subject, but we have already done five subjects. We observed that uh, here we can study different orientation of the heart, different type of torsos. So this is what we are doing now. We have the heart of the different patients. As you can observe, uh, the sizes are different, as all of us are different, uh, different torsos. Here, uh, here we have the clinical 12 lead ECG that were recorded to these patients, and these are the simulated ones. Uh, the good thing with the computational, uh, with cardiac modeling, is that you can fix all the properties and what we wanted here is to evaluate the effect of the anatomy on the, on the QRS, not taking into account possible uh, differences from patient to patient in ionic, uh, in ionic <coughs> properties or, or other or activation sequences that definitely we have, each of us has different ones. We wanted to investigate just the effect of the anatomy on the ECG. And this is our work, work nowadays, mainly mine. <laughs> And uh, this is the final comment. Uh, HPC high performance computing in cardiovascular science uh, were shown in disease, diagnostics, and also therapy. We demonstrate the power of HPC simulations for the investigation of disease, arrhythmia, and drug effects in human electrophysiology, and personalized models of human hearts based on clinical MRI enable deeper understanding of, of the ECG. That's all. Uh, these are all the acknowledgments. and. Uh, many people that were part of this research. But thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. Thank you for keeping the time. We have a few minutes for questions. Do we have a question? Yeah, so how much variation do you actually see if you look at different individualized models? And how much do you on the ECG, yeah. for example. Yeah, for example, uh, something that it's, uh, it's uh, expected is the size of the volume affects a lot. Uh, the size of the volume affects a lot to the uh, QRS width. Also, the torso volume uh, affects the amplitude, the amplitude of the QRS. We are just studying the QRS. Why? Because the QRS uh, accounts for the propagation, the electrical propagation, and I think this is the most important thing for that is not the ionic uh, remodeling of each of the patients, but the, the anatomy, the heart, and the fiber orientation. And also, the, we were studying also the orientation of the heart, the elevation, and also the rotation, and we were observing like differences in the precordial leads, uh, V1 and V2, uh, these ones that were very related to the orientation of, of, of the heart. Mm -hmm. And uh, definitely we need more patients. We have five by now. We expect to have uh, ten by the end of the month, but uh, we are starting. There are many people involved in these things. We need a team that is working in the image processing. Also, we are working on the machine, then other people in the electrophysiology. It requires some effort. Yeah. And I have a question. Yeah. Yeah. So you mentioned, uh, I think you're using 690 processes of Archer, and it's taken about 960. Yeah. Okay. What are the constraints there? Because obviously Archer has many more processes and that's a big chunk of time. Is it optimized? Well, we other were uh, doing a scalability study for, for Chase, that is the software we are using for doing these kind of simulations, and it was quite well until that part. 
then it was kind of uh, saturated. The, the performance. So potentially some help and collaboration around how to optimize Definitely, and, and in, in many around. things. Because to get that into a clinical time scale. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah, I mean, we, we, we need to do a lot of effort to make it like faster all the, all yeah. the process. And definitely you can help it. It would be amazing. And another thing as well on the image processing side. Yeah. So there's a new collaboration with Oxford. Yeah. Which I'll, I'll talk a little bit about later on. Yeah. With uh, Jay, the deep learning system that's going to be coming, coming online shortly, but maybe that's something yeah. that's important. Yeah, that would be amazing. <laughs> any, any other particular? Yeah, one of the things that sort of emerges as a generic requirement from this kind of organ based model is the concept of an automated workflow, which is your internet, all the processes that are necessary for this to work in a rapid way, namely the acquisition of the images. The processing of that segmentation, reconstruction, and then with that reconstructed image that's embedded into your simulation. Yes. The simulation runs in some secure environment, yep. fast, yep. and produces output, which, depending on who you are, could be very complicated or reduced to very simplified um, displays, for example, clinical decision making. But that whole pipeline is generic for a lot of time in the lab yeah. Do you have a comment on what you're doing in that sense? Are you just found a lonely fellow, or do you see, for example, this center of excellence helping to spread a common capability into which people could plug and play their favorite tools? Okay, by now it's, uh, it's uh, basic science. Definitely we are working with clinicians because we want to make it better. We are also uh, within this uh, Combiomed uh, European project, our idea is to make it bigger, making an electromechanical simulation, not only electrophysiological <coughs> simulations that are the ones that we are doing and we are showing here. So our plans now is trying to embed this uh, mechanical part into these simulations. Definitely we are also interested in improving performance, scalability, uh, also, the post-processing of the data, as you can imagine, we obtain and store a lot of data. We need to process afterwards. This also needs some <laughs> some work. And yeah, I'm yeah. just wondering if there are sort of generic tools that you think are useful. Is the problem to be that we yeah. produce things that, in the end, are bits and pieces and they don't need to operate? Well, indeed, the the from the MRI to the meshes is a pipeline that we are improving uh, with the increase of the number of patients. This is improved. I mean, by now we are uh, we have about uh, 38 patients uh, in the image plus, uh, part process. So we are improving that part, and that part can be useful afterwards. Now we it's taking about two hours. It's not wonderful, but it's uh, something that is feasible and maybe of uh, some use in the clinical practice, and it's can be uh, okay to bear. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Peter Kranzula from LRZ, and he's going to talk to us about general purpose supercomputing on Supermark, the, the large machine at LRZ. So, that looks almost correct. So, good morning everybody and uh, thank you for the nice invitation. Uh, we just found out that Munich is very close to, to, to London, so it took me a little bit more than two hours just door by door or something like uh, transportation is really interesting. Now, I should also give you a little warning. We're changing the topic here. I'm just a little computer scientist. And uh, the application talk that we just heard is, is a little bit different from what I'm going to tell you. My role is more like enabling people like you doing the research. And I want to show you what we have been doing with respect to supercomputing on SuperMOOC, which is the name of our machine, as Peter mentioned. And the special characteristic of SuperMOOC is it's a general purpose machine. And that has a reason. So let me first 
give you a little bit of an overview of the Leibniz Supercomputing Center. And what you see here is basically these five buildings. Now there's people working here, of course, and we have about 250 staff members, including student personnel and all those people taking care of the 24-hour shift. Uh, of course, we're not only doing supercomputing, we're doing other stuff like the Munich Scientific Network, which uh, has about, just to give you one number, 4,600 kilometers of cables. Uh, we're doing a visualization center, we're doing all those kinds of services that scientists need for their daily work. And we do that for about 100,000 students in the area, about 30,000 MPEs, including about 8,500 scientists. So, in our first role, we are the computer center for the Munich universities, and they get kind of basic support for their daily work. When you're a scientist, you sit at your desk, you want your email to work, you want to have access to a big printing machine, these kinds of things. The second level is that whenever things get bigger, you need to concentrate in order to put more stuff together and to use that efficiently. We're doing that on a regional level for the state of Bavaria and we are running a number of clusters which are comparable to other clusters which you have at your university, uh, which have different characteristics depending on whatever the uh, respective scientists need. And then we have one of the three national supercomputing centers together, they call the GCS, the Gauss Center for Supercomputing, and we're providing the highest level of performance, of computing performance, to the German scientists. So the German government, together with the three states, sponsors our machines, and we are trying to get a new machine every year at one of the three centers, having a nice cycle, making sure that all the application requests are fulfilled. And part of that is also what we say is the European Supercomputing Center means that some share of this national uh, event, of this national uh, strategy, is also to collaborate with people on the European level and to provide some of these cycles. Now, the machine was already mentioned. Here is a little picture. That is SuperMOOC, and SuperMOOC is actually two machines. We have one machine, which is in the background here. So the entire room has about 1,200 square meters, and I can also show you where it is. It is actually the top level room of that building here. And inside there we have this room with 1,200 square meters and SuperMOOC Phase 1 is about half of the room. SuperMOOC Phase 1 was installed in 2012, has about 150,000 cores and together it provides a peak performance of about 3.2 petaflops. Whatever that means, uh, let's have that standing here. Now, interesting enough, that was built in 2012. This is the upgrade. This is phase two that came in in 2015, as I said, three years later. And interestingly enough, here we have only two rows of cabinets. We need uh, about a quarter of the space and we need only a third of the electricity of phase one and we get the same performance. <coughs> which is the typical thing that everybody knows Moore's law. If you wait long enough, the machines get small enough. Now the point here is, this is the big machine in a sense where you can apply for cycles. Peter mentioned it, you don't have to pay anything. You pay with your good name. That means you propose, you put in a proposal, you kind of qualify your research, and as long as you're doing good research, you're getting on this machine. Actually, there's a second factor. The second factor is you need to be big enough. So the machine is really intended for scientific effort on computing, which is big and cannot be done on any of the departmental or university clusters. So we are fulfilling a niche on the one end of the spectrum. We are trying to provide computing power that goes beyond what do you have on your desk. And then, of course, you need to fill in with these other things. So when you mention cloud, for instance, it is, of course, important that there is a cloud somewhere for those who need the cloud. But once we want to get to this machine, uh, to this level, you would need to get access to that machine. And a typical allocation on the machine, just to give you an idea, is somewhere between 15 million CPU hours and 80 million. And I think the average is more 80 million like, yeah? So we are talking about 80 million CPU hours on one of these machines for one of the allocations per year. That's what these people have to spend. 
Now the question is why are we doing this? This is not for production, obviously. This is for frontline research. But the idea is, and Peter, you mentioned, it's, is it just for academic purpose? Yeah. And uh, luckily, he, yesterday he explained to me what academic purpose means with soccer and, and football. Yeah. Uh, now the question is, is this for academic purpose? Well, actually, if you take a little thing, and I'm, I'm doing shameless product placement here. Yeah. If you take out your smartphone, and actually, if you could go back in time, 20 years, 25 years, 30 years, if you go back 25 years. This would have been one of the hundred most powerful machines on the planet. Now, if you think of that, it is of academic purpose today. But if we think 25 years in the future, maybe we have that computing power somewhere here with the medical practitioner in the hospital going through and then doing the same simulations that we are doing. And that is, I think, the idea. And that's why we uh, are doing this and, and, and providing. Now, SuperMOOC has, as I said, one important qualification. It is general purpose. The idea that we are always following is that we have a wide variety of applications. Actually, there are 200 different application domains running on SuperMOOC. This is just an example. So we have everything from computational fluid dynamics, astrophysics, uh, biophysics, you, you name it. And that has to do with the characteristic of SuperMOOC. SuperMOOC is a general purpose machine. It uses the same processor as my laptop. The difference is it has 230,000 in total. And you can use all of these 230,000 together in order for you to do your applications. Now, strange enough, SuperMOOC, when we got it, was also uh, the biggest general purpose machine on the list. And <coughs> we managed to be the, fast, the fourth fastest machine on the planet, which I would even consider exceptional. That was, we were lucky with the procurement process, we got a good and powerful machine. I'll get back to that a little bit later when we see what the situation is today. But in a sense, what we have here is a machine which is compatible to what you have in your desktop. You scale up your applications and once you go beyond what your own system is delivering, you could apply for one of the cycles on such a European machine. Of course, SuperMOOC is not the first machine we had. It's just kind of, for us, uh, the last instantiation. And we always had machines trying to follow that curve. So you have the year at the bottom line. And on the vertical line, you have performance and the storage capabilities. And following this exponential growth, uh, we are trying to make sure that at the front line of research, you have the computing power that you need for your daily work. That is our task. And that, of course, continues with SuperMOOC phase two. And at the moment, we are already working on the procurement of the next phase. Now, that has effects and requirements on the users. You need to make sure that you are basically following the characteristics of SuperMOOC or following the characteristics of the machine. One of them is the number of cores. I mean, this is just the last four machines. And the number of cores has been steadily increasing. Yeah? We're going from basically 1,500 cores to about 230,000 cores. So is your software capable of using these cores? And actually, you should use it efficiently. That's the other point. Yeah. So you need, as we've heard before, already do that efficiently. We also see these. I don't want to go into details here, but these are basically graphs, pie charts, which give you ideas on the number of applications and how many cores they are using. So not all of these applications are using the full machine. Actually, we have uh, about 15 to 20 applications which can use the full machine. And the machine is built specifically for making that possible. But the point is that, of course, many cores, many applications are using smaller versions and scale up only in those cases where the, the data goes up. Now. Uh, we can also see a similar effect if we take a look at the top 500 list. That's the list from 1996, and it gives you basically the position of the top 500 list and the number of cores in these systems. So in 1996, most of the systems were uh, around 100, between 10 and 100 cores, which we well remember. If we go further into the future, we see 10 years later, we are somewhere between 1,000 and 10,000 cores, and again, 10 years later, we see the situation last year where 
there are machines around 100,000 cores, and then, of course, there are some few machines with a million cores. So if we just continue that trend, 10 years from now, we will all have, all have a million cores available for doing the research. And I'm just wondering what my mobile phone will have in 20 years, how many cores will be running on that. Now, I also want to give you some ideas on the applications. This is an application that was going, uh, what was competing for the Golden Bell Award from two groups at both universities in Munich, and they were working basically on the simulation of seismic activities in a volcano. And they were able to use 147,000 cores of SuperMOOC with a production speed of 1.4 petaflops. So with a peak performance of 3.2 petaflops for that system at that point in time, we were able to do 44.5% of peak performance for production runs. Now the production run here needs about 5 to 7 hours. So that means you use the entire system for 5 to 7 hours for only one application. And that is of course also associated with costs. I'll get to that in a, in a second. The other point is of course even if it looks general purpose and very kind of homogeneous, the architecture in the background is of course already complex. So this is the architecture of the system and don't take in all the details. I just want to impress you about the complexity. And I consider that a very simple system compared to what the next one is. So we are also getting up there. And if you want to use the entire system, you need to take into account things like the number, the amount of memory per core. Peter is nodding, yeah? For those of you who don't see it, because that's one of the challenges today. Yeah? We have many cores. We also need to know how much memory we have per core. If we take a look, closer look for the two phases between SuperMOOC, that's all x86 processors. As I said, the same one as we have it on the old desktop. But of course, there's much more characteristics here which we need to take into account when we are programming these systems. And actually, uh, if we take it a little bit closer, what you're applying for is access to one of the machines at one of these three centers. So there is already three different systems and somebody decides which of the system fits best to your application requirements. So you basically are, are already fixed on one of the systems depending on what your application is doing. Now the other point, as I said, efficiency. Why is it important to run efficiently? This curve gives us the power consumption of the center. And you see that we have been steadily increasing. So consider that for your home, uh, that would mean your power bill goes up and up and up, and you find all the devices your kids have been placing around the house. Yeah? Uh, in our case, of course, it means we have already, with, with all the systems that are getting in here, SuperMOOC is coming in, we are increasing the power bill. And we are still limited by the public funding. So there is a budget envelope, and we can only spend so much power on it. And we had a discussion over, over drinks yesterday, and one of the points was, we are now in a situation where the computing capability is basically limited by the amount of power we can, the amount of electricity we are able to pay for. So we are coming to a point where we are buying bigger machines that we can actually run with the power bill that we have available. And if power gets cheaper, we could do more computation, which is also something to keep in the back of the mind. Now for SuperMOOC, what we did, and I should mention just as a rule of thumb, the power consumption at our center is for one hour we're spending about 1,000 euro just on electricity, which also means in three days we are spending the annual budget for one PhD student just on electricity, and in one year we are spending 120 PhD students on electricity. Something to keep in the back of the mind. Now SuperMOOC is a positive example. I believe it's one of the most energy efficient systems on the planet. The reason for that one is for each of the cabinets, that's the empty room before SuperMOOC came in, we have these water cycles, these water connectors. And SuperMOOC is the first machine on that scale that was using warm water cooling. Now the question is always, why should a user be concerned with running energy efficiently? 
why is this? I mean, I want my code. You want your your exact scientific experiments to be done on the system, yeah? Well, actually, the reason is if you and we together are able to save some energy, we could use it for other application, and that goes back to you. So you can compute more if you're running more in energy efficient. And we are trying to do research from a computer science point, making sure that the system is running as efficiently as possible. And that needs to be taken into account when you run your system. Actually, we are trying to run your code with the optimal frequency, as one of the examples. We are trying to increase the cooling temperature. So SuperMook is cooled with water that can be up to 36 degrees Celsius warm. And then using some of the effects that uh, outside us today is usually colder, so we don't need any energy to cool down the system. Now, the saving just by the measures we did for SuperMook is 2 million euros just in electricity for making sure that we put all, all these energy efficiency parameters and uh, tools into the system. Now, that all comes back to the user. And here we have one application. That is Peter Coveney's application. Peter and his group, some of the people are here also in the room, have been using SuperMook. And they were actually the first ones to ever use SuperMook phase one and two together. Now, Peter's application was running on 37 hours. So I think we started Friday lunchtime and then basically used all the weekend. And then they had to finish on Monday morning to go back to your regular operations. They've been using 240,000 cores, consumed 8.9 million CPU hours and produced some 5 terabytes. All nice numbers. But that's not the important numbers here. The important thing was when we talked, I think we talked on Tuesday that week, and Peter told me, you know, it's fantastic. We got some new results. And that is the important thing. And actually, Peter also gave me just, I, I didn't know, that was just recently published. That's the uh, magazine of the Bavarian Academy of uh, Sciences and Humanities. And there is a, a huge article in here which basically shows how we got from the original small-scale experiments to something that Peter has been doing. Now, Peter's application has also one strange characteristic. It is not the kind of application that usually run on the system. So he comes in with something that is new, that is different. But what he's doing is, he's again pushing the front. He's basically putting something new in, which we need to take into account when we talk about the future. So, uh, that's what I wanted to do with you. Now, one of the things we see is, we need to invest in the future just by taking the previous system to SuperMOOC, we had an increase of a factor of 50 to 70. Just the performance increase is enormous. And while we increased the performance by a factor of 50, the power consumption was only increased by a factor of three. So at one point, it is cheaper to get rid of the old stuff, put some new stuff in, get more performance at less price for the electricity. And that's an interesting point. Now, of course, we also need to take into consideration other things. And I mentioned the, the next machine, uh, codenamed SuperMOOC Next Generation at this point in time. So I'm not allowed to talk too much about the procurement. But I wanted to give you some ideas of where we are going to. One idea comes from the top 500. If you take a look at the top 500, and you were right, Pittstein is position 8, as we see on this slide. Uh, all these systems are using accelerators, or most of the systems in the front. Actually, we also see that the performance is kind of not increasing as much as it used before. We see this little breakdown. And we see that we get the performance only if we invest in different kinds of accelerators. So actually, as you see here, uh, at least 80 systems are already using accelerators for one or the other task. And especially those systems in front have to use accelerators. So if you want to continue advancing science, we need to think about these things. Yeah. What is not only the typical application mix, like number of cores, the memory per core, the interconnect, those typical things that you think of an HPC machine, but also how many accelerators would you put in? Is there a place for virtualization? Actually, 
You also mentioned it, so as I said, I don't need to talk anymore. The point here is, of course, you need to adapt your workflow to a system so that the, the supercomputer is only one step in your workflow. And in order to do that, to give you the flexibility, there needs to be something that uses virtualization or cloud technology to make sure in your workflow, and then you go from there to the supercomputer. You have different systems, workflows, high throughput computing, and as I mentioned, we always need to go down with the power consumption. If we get the budget for the new machine, the budget for the new machine means it's iron, it's electricity, and it's some manpower, some humans. So we need to make sure that the electricity is a small part in order to have enough for the next machine itself. So uh, I'm coming here to one last slide. This is kind of an overview. This is a, a conceptual slide, which is kind of giving you the idea, but not enough details about what the system will be. We will continue to have general purpose HPC nodes, simply because we have this wide variety of applications, and they can live here without changes. Those codes that want to be faster or need more performance will need to have some kind of accelerator or many core or whatever. So we have the heterogeneity in the system itself. We will also think about one important factor is all the storage capabilities and the other thing is that we also need to think the interconnection to the outside world which will be done by cloud. So the cloud is a forefront. It's kind of the entry point to the big machine. And then what we didn't talk about so far, but we saw some nice pictures in, in, in Anasoc, was uh, all this issue about whenever we compute here, we need to analyze at one of the points. So the, uh, the point here is the next systems will look more like this, heterogeneous, and you need to consider how that fits best to what your application is doing and how could you uh, adapt your application to that. Let me just finish with three more slides. One of the things I'm mentioning here is it works only if we work together. And putting the role model here and some other people in the room, uh, Marian Bubak over there is a similar example to myself. He's also working with the users. And it is very important that we see this as a partnership. We need uh, this partnership in order to make sure that we are using, exploiting the machines as best as possible. We get the input from you, we understand better what you want to do, and we can make sure that the computer science aspect is being dealt with. The other point, and that is mentioned in, in a paper here, uh, I'm not sure if the slides will be available, I'm happy to, to give them away. The other point is of course that uh, you also we see that there is a pattern on how this work works together. One of the important <coughs> things here is this is our cookbook. We do this for the partnership. And basically we always kind of do these workshops which are incremental. So we need points where people sit together. Actually whatever you saw in terms of applications was done in a workshop where people were sitting together at a desk for a couple of days trying to get their codes up. And the good results that I was able to demonstrate a direct conclusions from that. Because sitting together, making sure that the applications work together, gives the benefits. And with that one, I thank you for your attention. I'm ready if you have any questions. Any questions for Edita? Uh, yes, thanks very much. I've got a question on that last point about individualized services. How you can possibly, when you've got, as Peter made a point right at the front, the computation can work across every type of discipline, mm -hmm. biomedical. Absolutely. Um, and however many people you get in a the room, there's going to be some lack of understanding and appreciation Absolutely, yes. on, on certain sites. Therefore, is there a danger that something that would be perfectly in the sweet spot for super much like here's the other machines around the world could slip through the cracks just because there's somebody on either side of the desk who doesn't quite get either the power calculation or the applicability of that into their own the, the danger that you're mentioning is like actually a danger of there's always limited 
budget, there's always limited time of what we can do and there's limited resources. But I think there is a danger, as you said, that something is not attracted accordingly. What we did on the German national strategy was we, we kind of defined uh, focus areas. And our focus area at LSC is that we are doing uh, environmental computing, we're doing life science, we're doing astrophysics. And those three communities are those which, which get this special treatment first. Yeah? The idea, the hope that I have is if we kind of have this light tower experiments, right? and that was an example, if we have these kind of things, we can learn from them on how to improve the situation for those who come later. The other centers have different focus area and they're doing the same thing. And as I said, it is a hope, but there is a danger that with the limited uh, resources and budget and time that something uh, falls apart. Of course, the, our colleague from Microsoft in the, in, in the last area is also, there is a, an area where other providers can come in and take this up. And I think that's how it should be working. Yeah. So, as I mentioned, we are, we are pushing one side of the envelope, we are on one side of the curve, and we're not there for doing everything. We're really doing that particular and, and we're taking that example as a as, as positive thing, hopefully. It's really great to see your five-year kind of refresh cycle saying that really five years to throw away the opportunity. How long do you think it takes for a hero run like Peter's massive run to become commodity? A oh, good question. Oh, that's a good question. Because so, you've seen that, right? From now to, to, to the run, when you had your machine, 2007, 2012, those size of runs, and I could probably work it out, but it was that version on the web. Where, what's that, you know, that's then a university level machine today. So, what's that time scale going from super mid to university machine scale? Now, of course, I cannot answer that in, in Peter's case. He had, would have to answer the, the, the uh, thing himself. Now we have an additional point here, and here comes the academic interest, of course. Most or many of these codes are being developed by students during the PhD thesis or something. So after five years when they are going, we're still struggling of making sure that the codes continue to live. Some of the colleagues in academia have, have done that. They have systems basically where one student steps in after the other one. Some others really have one project after the other one, there's no continuation. And then I think it's very hard also to track how long it takes from systems of this kind to something that you have on your desktop. But of course, also there, there are some situations. The German uh, funding organization, research funding organization, has just now had a call on sustainable software, meaning could we do something more on that aspect? Now that is a little bit different when you go to smaller scales, where more systems are around. Yeah? But uh, giving you an exact timing, how long it takes from here to there, I think it also depends mostly on the application itself. And um, not sure, I would also guess on the user demand. I'm not sure how many hospitals would be interested to get, to get access to, to this kind of machine or how long it would take for them to get interest. Yeah? You gave me some examples, but you have more details on that. For discussion today. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Peter, I think that the at one point, uh, at some point, it could be interesting. Then we could take off the, of the software that's set on your machine. For example, uh, the previous software was a lot of about complex transport dynamics, and many people are using ANSYS software for this purpose. Mm -hmm. So, what about uh, this type of software? And what about, let's say, okay, okay. the licenses oh. of such and such around the car? Licensing, licensing is an issue and of course open source is a, is a good solution for that. Now I can also, you mentioned computational fluid dynamics. About one third of our systems is being used for computational fluid dynamics. The, the Technical University Munich alone has about 50 different codes on just computational fluid dynamics. Yeah? That comes back also to the previous question. There is lots of codes, there is some providers but even the big companies don't have these machines. So if, if, in, if just take a little simple example like MPI. Uh, Intel for developing its own MPI version doesn't have a machine like this standing around. Yeah. So they are collaborating again with us to make sure that the next 
MPI versions when these machines get more widely used uh, are able to, to uh, have all the functionality you need. So answering that question, go back to, to how many codes are being used, which codes are used. One uh, third of the machine is computational fluid dynamics. Another third is astrophysics, high energy physics, uh, material physics, material sciences. And the, the third third of the machine is being used for the wide variety. Yeah? I, I know that one year computer science was 1%, uh, next year it was 0.1%. Uh, so that's the variation we have in there. And that's again the, uh, the call for a general purpose system where anybody can do something useful, more or less. Would I have a quick question or comment? One of the uh, large German auto manufacturers in the Free Rest of Africa, uh, which is not far from our place, which is not from your place have, have just, we, we did a crash simulation the afternoon, they've just moved their HPC facility to data centers in Iceland. And I visited them two years ago, yes. Yeah. So they're doing remote visualization, effectively set up a private cloud to do their, their work there. Of course, the reason that they're doing that is because of energy efficiency to reduce the power bill, which is electricity mm -hmm. is very expensive. Could you ever foresee a situation where facilities such as yours will be effectively offshore to cheaper energy locations if the network bandwidth and the security aspects are uh, satisfactory? Well, you mentioned the network bandwidth, which is one still problematic issue, and the, the speed of light is, is the barrier which we all live in here. So there is a limit on what we can do. The, I would also say it's, again, the difference between production and, and research. What we are doing here is the system itself is a research product. And when we started with SuperMOOC, for instance, IBM said nobody needs a warm water pool system. Now, the, the US are now building the three fastest machines in the US at this point in time. Two of them are using the same technology. Yeah? So that we're, by, by putting the systems close to us and investing a little bit more on some of the aspects, we get the additional benefits of training, of expertise, and you mentioned this company in, in, in Munich with the cars. Uh, many of our uh, Finnish PhD students get jobs there and they, they are well trained, so I think that's also our role as an mm. academic uh, uh, trainer and, and professor to make sure that we have some perspective for them. Yeah? So again, being at the forefront, experimenting with the system itself, doing some application, uh, means we're also getting the additional benefits of producing experts which can then do this on smaller scales. And then also in the hospital, they would also benefit from experts that, that can do that, and uh, in the pharmaceutical industry, wherever. Yeah? Yeah. So I think there is a good point for that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. We're just about out of time for that. Tip. So. Next speaker is Peter again. Okay. Um, this time, we talk to the first. I should try and remember it. Absolutely. Keep me, keep me on the track. See if we can get this thing to connect. What's happening here? <coughs> okay. Uh, we've had one talk which, in a certain sense, is driven by uh, the pursuit currently of academic understanding, say, of the cardiac system and the complexities of it. Then we had a talk which was about use of large-scale resources in support of scientific endeavours. And my talk is going to be focused mainly on an area which is uh, adumbrated a little by previous comments about the molecular end of personalised medicine and the way in which we can try to help uh, with what I called earlier actionable decisions. So if we're able to do our science rapidly, accurately, precisely, and reproducibly, we have something that starts to be credible 
from the point of view of taking decisions. And that decision making in science goes back to the ability to predict things and then act on them. I mean, the paradigm case that everyone is familiar with is the weather. Weather forecasting is in this category. We usually believe short-term weather forecasts, and if you're thinking about how those are run, they're run with large-scale computers controlled by meteorological offices and typically associated with government labs. And there's a security issue around them as well. But our idea is, I want to know tomorrow's weather today uh, for the reason that I can then decide whether to bring an umbrella into work. And in the context of clinical decision making, it's totally analogous. I want to be able to make a decision that's eventually going to be approved by regulatory authorities so someone who's clinically trained can take a decision based on that. So I need to be able to do all of the things I mentioned earlier. And then I can transfer the technology. We're not really there yet, but people are now in things like the FDA already talking about how we implement computational methodologies in, you know, for example, clinical trials. So there's a lot at stake here. That's the clinical end, but there's this other end with industry, and a big target there is pharmaceutical companies. And what's the problem with pharmaceutical companies? Uh, I mean, I heard today that, uh, um, um, well, I think it was today, you know, it, uh, several of them report quarterly earnings, and sometimes it sounds fine and dandy uh, that they're making uh, good, uh, regular, uh, three monthly returns and so on for the for the for the for, for their uh, stockholders and so on. But the fundamental issue is the problem that it takes, on average, ten years and two point five billion dollars to make a single drug, and uh, we now live in a post-genomic era where we have projects like the 100,000 Genomes Project in the UK, sequencing the hell out of everyone, and we're told, as I was mentioning earlier, there's something called personalised medicine. We're not after a blockbuster, though a pharmaceutical company may find that attractive. We're supposed to believe that we can make lots of individual drugs, so we might call them niche busters. And how are we going to go from a model that takes 10 or 12 years to produce one single drug to a picture where we can produce many of them? I submit to you that the current methodology that's used in that industry needs to be changed. And one way it will be changed is through technology of the kind we're discussing today that can produce actionable decisions fast enough to direct experimental work because the laboratory work and the clinical trials are extremely expensive and time consuming. That puts a challenge out for that industry to step up to the plate in using the technology. So our interest in the science lead us to devise methods that are in those categories of reproducibility, fast and accurate. And then the question is, who's going to pick up these methods? And they're not going to be picked up in academic settings using open computing systems, which is why we have to worry about the combination of high performance computing in a public framework to develop methods and then see how they might be picked up. And that involves interactions with clouds. <coughs> So I want to quickly acknowledge people, because I tend to forget this at the end of a the talk. There's a whole range of people who are behind the work that's going on here, and it's an injustice to only list certain of the names, but currently what I'll talk about involves active collaborations with a couple of uh, pharma companies. You've seen some of the logos there already, to do with LRZ, Archer, the Hartree Centre, which was set up a few years ago by the government in order to try and address the needs of industry to use high performance computing, and we'll see how that works in the context of all of this work. But at the top, we've also got a bunch of these people in cloud provision, and the question there is, can they uh, help to use these technologies in, in a uh, pressing sense from, a, from an industrial perspective? So that's a bunch of uh, things that I needed to mention. The science behind this case, which was deployed on Supermook, for example, in that so-called heroic effort, is about trying to make binding energy predictions. And I know Herman from Climate here will talk about that specifically and what uh, Janssen's interests are. This is becoming very interesting because it is in the category of, I think I know how to reliably predict these things now. And historically, in the context of most pharmaceutical companies, they don't pay attention to this stuff. They listen to your explanation after they've discovered their their candidate drugs. So we're trying to change that 
And one of the ways we do it is by using very high-end uh, computing to get our answers on an actionable time scale. This revolves around, in the instance of our work, something we call a binding affinity calculator. It's emphatically a work. It has a concatenation of a large number of steps, some of which are low compute, others are high intensity. And we have to run that work through flow fast enough to get decisions that are tomorrow's weather today, not in three weeks' time. Because tomorrow's weather in three weeks' time, might I say, is of academic interest. It doesn't mean it's not interesting, because in three weeks I could look at what the prediction for tomorrow was and I'd see whether it was any good, and I might need to change my algorithm. But it's lost, let's say, 99% of the people who are interested in the decision when it's taken on a, a, a rapid time scale. So how do we step up to do this stuff? I want to talk to you about it, and I want to show you how you can deploy this potentially in a cloud environment as well as on a very large super. And then the question is, what do you want to do? Is it more research? Do you want to deploy the application in a commercial context? So the big picture here is a black box. In the end, if it was a clinical person, that's our problem. These modeling methods are not understood by conventional medical, medically trained people because they don't technically learn about modeling and simulation. You'd like a black box which just takes a bunch of drug candidates against a uh, protein which is uh, indicated there and it ranks them according to how tightly they bind because the binding, is, uh, as Herman will tell us, is quite an important first property to identify for developing lead compounds. So we've actually been working on the automation of this for quite a few years and the scale at which we can operate depends on the technology and the speed. Okay, so the audience will have a subset of people who know that if this is teaching grandmother to suck eggs, but if you are not in the area of concern, I need to just point out what's at stake scientifically here is being able to do calculations of free energies rapidly, reliably, uh, accurately, and precisely. And that hasn't been the case until very recently. So we just want to calculate a free energy of binding, and I won't go into all the technical details of how this is done, because the talk doesn't allow for that, but there are some methods for doing it. We've been uh, pioneering the way we can do this reliably. Uh, some of them are so-called endpoint methods, so you compute the free energies of the protein and the drug that are the initial ingredients and the, the product, as it were, of the binding has a free energy associated with it as well. Uh, this has been referred to uh, by terrible acronyms, which look absolutely appalling, but uh, one runs uh, full all atom molecular dynamic simulations and applies certain uh, algorithms to analyze the trajectories. Some of them are based around the assumption of a continuum solvent here and revolve around a so called Poisson Boltzmann uh, surface area approximation. Now, uh, historically, people would just run one of these molecular dynamic simulations, and the literature is replete with such simulations. And uh, there is a, a difficulty with them, but I want to quickly just mention an alternative aspect, which in a computer is entirely plausible, though not in a laboratory, because we believe alchemy died out uh, maybe a thousand years or so ago. You're calculating free energies. It's a function of state. So if I can cut, if, if I can calculate a difference in free energies by going around a so-called thermodynamic cycle. For a experimentalist, you have to do it in real space. But if you're in a computer, you can go around in alchemical space. So you just alchemically change, in this instance, the green ligand from one compound into another. And it turns out, as they say, that then you can calculate the difference, that's the relative free energy for the two drugs in that protein, quite efficiently, but still with computational demands, which are non-trivial. Historically, one simulation was more than enough. So I just remind you, in line with what Dieter said at the beginning of the millennium, the UK's national supercomputer, Andy, you may have been in Manchester at the time, Cesar, had 512 cores on it, uh, an SGI origin, I seem to remember. 512 cores, you might run one MD simulation once. 
Look what happens if you run it many times. This is just a message without going into the detail. It's really uh, a recognition that molecular dynamics is nothing more than a stochastic process. It has Gaussian statistics associated with it. That means there's an incredible sensitivity to the initial conditions. So you run one simulation, the next person who comes up will run, get a different answer. Unless you somehow conspire with your software to, to be so clever that any time someone submits a job, they run from exactly the same seed as you did. But that's not realistic. And the reason for that is related to a, pro a property of dynamics that's simply not been understood modern, in modern terms. If you're going to have a system that goes to equilibrium, the individual trajectories that make up the, the equilibrium description, which is probabilistic, must have a chaotic nature. That means any trajectory, no matter how close to a neighbouring one, will diverge exponentially fast. And so you can't possibly think you're going to predict the property of the long-term system from a single state, because that state will always be an approximation to the true state of the system. And I just suggest for a minute, if we know anything about initial conditions and the numerics of them, any real system will be overwhelmingly in an initial condition which is non-computable, it will be in the set of irrationals. But any computable number is in the class of zero measure. Maybe uh, it's, it's a computable number and finite representation. So you have a problem there, and the only way to deal with it is through appealing to statistical mechanics in the way you should. You run ensembles and you compute the average properties directly. Most people would argue you just run one long simulation. If you run it for long enough, you compute the time average. But the time average is only equal to the ensemble average in the limit where the time is infinite, and that infinite time would have to be of the order of a primary occurrence time, which is infinitely longer than the lifetime of the universe. So it's not really a sensible thing to do, though almost every paper I read in molecular dynamics does it. Anyway, we do it this way, you find a gazillion answers, but it's just like weather forecasting. Run enough of them, n replicas, such that if I run n plus 1, the error doesn't change. What is n? There's no theory which tells us that. But the answer turns out to be manageable on these supercomputers. So this is what happened if you ran one simulation. You don't know what the errors are because they're out of your control, but after you've done the work we do, you know these errors are huge. So your predictions have no discriminatory value whatsoever. I want to reduce the error bars, and that's what I can do if I run ensembles with differing initial conditions. They differ only in the choice, as it were, from the Gaussian distribution of velocities. Each velocity component for every atom is chosen from a random seed, drawn from a, a, a Gaussian distribution. So if my model has 40,000 atoms in it, it might do. Three times that number of random numbers have to be generated as the initial condition, and then it goes off. And it goes off in many different directions. But that's the beauty of it. I'm now sampling a huge amount of play space. So the methods that we have are based on running ensembles, and they are beautiful for current machines, multi-core machines. To coin a phrase, our high performance computers are not getting faster, they're getting fatter. This is a ba basic problem of the human condition in the Western world. But because they're getting fatter, we can run many jobs at once. And in the time we do one, we do the whole goddamn lot. So I now need maybe 10,000 cores, and I get everything out, reliably mm -hmm. with error bars. I can do it in a few hours. And the issue then is, uh, what can I do with these calculations? So one of the techniques, which is the endpoint method, has diversity in the types of molecules I can look at. Uh, they're not restricted by um, approximations that actually do dog us in the exact alchemical methods. They're exact, but actually only apply in a perturbative sense, and they're not reliable when charges change on the molecules. But the foundations of this are deep and light in our understanding of uh, dynamics of, of complex uh, classical systems. So actually the protocol that you need has to run a large number of these replicas. How many you choose in the end is a question, if you're paying for it, how much can you afford? You pay 
to reduce the error bars. And you can pay if you care about that, or if it's not so important, you run less of them. But you vary the initial conditions, you collect all the trajectory data, it's a lot, and then you compute. So this comes down to the mapping of the science and the challenge onto the architecture of your machine. And that's an example of the kind of workflow we have. You prepare the model, and then you develop enough replicas, which, which are then just fed into your supercomputer, or cloud, as we'll come on to. You run through a so-called equilibration phase, and then the production, when you think you're in the equilibrium state, collecting the data up to the period you need. So I've just got indica indicative numbers of what amounts of data you're accumulating, the number of cores per in, a sort of job here in cloud terminology, maybe the sort of instance that you're running, how long it takes. And if you just tot up those numbers at the moment there, it's a few hours. I can get the answers, if I do this correctly, within four or five hours. And then you can play games with uh, the exact nature of the hardware. I might have some accelerators that I'm interested in. How quickly can I get the answer? So roughly speaking, a few hours here. That's actionable for a laboratory decision that might suggest people to do something. It's also actionable for a clinician who'd like to know the answer for a particular drug. Let's say in the HIV protease case, there are nine FDA approved drugs. Which one am I going to give to the patient who presents? Well, if you use big data methods, you'd regress against the data for everyone who's ever been seen previously and try to suggest this looks like that. That's statistical inference, and it's pretty powerful, but it's limited. Personalized medicine means I'm dealing with data for you, not extrapolation or interpolation from the data on others. So the ties method is similar to the ESMAX method. These things just parallelize beautifully on supercomputers. And you can, again, get accurate results within uh, a few hours here. So then you have to design user-friendly front ends to facilitate potentially anyone or different kinds of people using this stuff. And the workflow that helps to do that has a user-friendly client. We've designed this thing so that actually you could submit your jobs to any of a range of resources. They could be conventional HPC, local, remote, or a commercial cloud. And the back manages this. So the picture of how you set up this is vaguely like that, with the resource could be HPC or cloud to run the, the production and then feeding off analysis to the results. These are the type of machines we've been using from the HPC end. You've heard quite a few things about them. I don't need to dwell on them. You'll recognize many of the names. Some of them are GPU accelerated, others are not. And there's the story about Supermook. We've heard about that. If you want to deploy this on an HPC uh, environment and go into the very large end of this game where the cores are getting to millions to tens of millions and beyond as we move to the exascale, we actually find that definitions of, uh, in the, say, open MPI standard aren't suitable enough to run this type of computation. That standard is now having to be adjusted to accommodate these calculations. But you can imagine that this is a highly scalable environment to deploy all these things. So one of the uh, plots that people like to display are benchmarks. And I'm just showing you some amusing benchmarks for performance of these codes on different architectures. If you work in a cottage industry and you run with a small amount of GPUs, the story is the GPU is much better than a, than a multi-core machine. And that may well be true, but the picture is blurred when you have access to very large resources. So for those who care about this, there are some in the audience, the metric that matters is how many nanoseconds can I get per day out of my architecture? And just look at those things. Cartesian, his state is a GPU-enabled machine. I said it's in the top 500. I can generate about 100 nanoseconds per day from that. And Cartesius in the Netherlands doesn't do particularly well for NAMD because even when I throw more nodes at it, it doesn't speed up very much. Maybe it's getting to 50 nanoseconds per day. But if I run on the supermodel, actually Archer is the same as Gavin might be interested to know. 
If I throw enough nodes at my problem, I can run these things substantially faster. So please don't tell me I can't run my application faster on a multi-core machine than I can on a GPU where my economics is concerned. It simply depends on how many nodes you throw at the problem, how much your budget is, and all the other issues. And this, this is actually for Grow Maps, because that application was NAMD. Everyone what has their favorite MD application, and, and, and Grow Maps, which some people say is the fastest code in the West and all the rest of it, doesn't do particularly well on some of these platforms compared with NAMD. It does better on others. The picture is different. Cartesius, it does better because it's a Dutch code and Cartesius, you'd expect. They've spent a bit more time optimizing the deployment there. So the commercial cloud thing is the alternative to running on these machines. You pay, as it were, for the service someone else delivers it. Either you get access to the hardware, memory and storage, or what's more common really is software as a service. The end user doesn't need to worry about all this infrastructure. They just submit jobs to something that runs and produces the results. So for us, we have applications of this binary ability now on the AWS uh, Invert Cloud. We're talking, we also have something with DNA Nexus, who provide a cloud environment, and I think we may hear more about that later. And currently looking with Microsoft at deployment on their high performance computing system. This is just an architecture diagram. The difference of, in the structure of the back when it runs, for example, on the Amazon uh, cloud rather than on the HPC service that I put up rapidly before. Uh, if you're dealing with cloud scaling, what does it look like? Well, there's the sort of plot number of nanoseconds per day, again, number of cores. The number of cores is embarrassingly small here. It's in the tens. I was showing you ones which run up to thousands before, but that's the size of the unit of parallelism on an AWS cloud, right? They don't care particularly about distributed, you know, long range tight interconnects. The most parallelism you'll get is what you get on a node, and it might be 32 cores, or it might be 128. Many of our applications will run happily on those, but they won't run as fast as if I had more cores available or the interconnects were faster, etc. So that's just showing you, you know, maybe I can get seven nanoseconds a day there, and what could I get on a GPU in this? That's showing you what I can get there with GPUs from uh, AWS, 20 nanoseconds with the uh, 2x GPU space. So these are things that you care about if you want your answers in a hurry. How much are you going to pay? Where are you going to deploy? And then the, the interesting thing I mentioned with uh, Microsoft Azure, this is an HPC cloud in the sense that it has InfiniBand interconnects between these nodes, so it's got the possibility to support larger scale HPC applications in the sort of area we're interested in. So you can get some benchmarks in this case. These were actually reported on my behalf by Kenji and his colleagues uh, in the Microsoft Azure research team ahead of the presentation I gave at the American Chemical Society on the 2nd of April. These show what you can get on that platform. They haven't yet deployed the GPU case, but we will have some figures for that shortly. So then the question is, where do you put your investment? If you're a, an academic at this point in time, such as ourselves in our work, we're actually enjoying the ability to deploy on very large computers and uh, we could always run there, but you have some limitations to that model because uh, Dieter was effectively saying it though he didn't spell it out, it's an issue that's close to his heart as well as mine, the model in the supercomputer center is go to the end of the queue, in other words batch queues rule okay. I submit my job and I wait my time, turn in the queue. Well, I just told you a few minutes ago that these applications depend on being run in a timely fashion. So you're going to be thwarted by those facilities for as long as they are in that fashion. And that's where clouds are potentially attractive to people because in principle, as we say, you pay your money and you take your choice, you pay for a service where you expect to run the thing on demand. So you can get the thing to run. And potentially, if the cloud is elastic, at scale that suits these applications. 
So that's interesting. The question then becomes one of cost. Who's going to pay the ferryman? Again, as an academic, we tend not to look at the money. Some academics use the cloud. It's the lower end of this business where it's a few hundred to thousands of dollars to run some jobs. But at the scale of these type of applications, it costs significant money. And the question is, how much money is it worth deploying in these environments? Is it worth setting up your own high-performance computing machine? Is a facility like the Hartree Centre that has HPC but geared to industry sufficient to meet the needs? These are all questions that are worth looking at. What we could say here is, uh, in the cloud environment, you do tend to be heavily on your own, needing to do a lot of installation with your own stuff. But if you've got the experts, you can run. So I think I've just given you a quick overview of a number of aspects to this type of application. They're kind of very real in the sense that there are people in this community, in the audience, who are trying to figure out what scale of high performance computing and in what manner they want to use it. And the issues are, uh, as I said here, to do with um, the balance between your own investments uh, locally in your machine and ones where you would uh, run by outsourcing. And that, that's part of a, a hot discussion that I'm happy to facilitate here. So with that, I'll stop and thank you for your attention. Okay, well, I don't need to go ahead. So, in your parameter suites that you're doing, the very the large ones, um, do you need to do you know, all that 56 or all GPU, or could you have a mix of both? In which case, are you introducing another parameter and then for other reservoirs? And, you, know, you mean I could run part of the calculation? Well, we'll come back to, to Dieter's point. In the next generation of supercomputers, like it or not, are going to be accelerated to some degree. And it's not going to be you know, separate, separate GPU plus going to be separate, separate x86. Right. That will happen to some extent. But for the bigger machines, they're going to have a combination of both. So, how then do you exploit that? If you, by, by running on both GPUs and x86 and your regular cores, you're introducing a new parameter into the mix. Well, so, you know, we know the performance of these codes on different architectures. So if we have available a sector of a machine, some partition that's GPU accelerated, and we know the performance of that, and there are requirements from the end user of getting a throughput of a certain level, we can start target those components on that part of the... Those the parts of, Yes, you can do it heterogeneously. But what is likely to happen is, of course, you'll get different parts of the calculation running at different times. Perhaps a more interesting thing initially, though, is how many of these instances, so to speak, you want to run. If it costs you real money, because that's the terrifying thing about a cloud, the minute you launch a commercial job, the dollars start whirling. How many do you want to run? And you don't necessarily want to do, let's say, the 25 I discussed. You might want to do a smaller number initially. See how the error bar is faring. And if you need to drive it lower, add more in. So you want that kind of dynamic flexibility, probably. But that's all potentially doable in this environment. Okay. Yeah, you, you touched on the security aspects there. I assume for biomedicine, there's going to be stricter requirements than, say, astrophysics or particles. Um, you say the cloud providers have strong security models. Is that because they meet certain standards as opposed to? No, the, the security issue is seen to be paramount for many of these type of applications, and I maybe Herman will speak to this or contribute to the discussion. But if you're doing biomedical stuff, you've got two categories. One would be, say, patient level data, which you need to safeguard and make, you know, have follow various directives to secure it. And that can be very relevant to clinical activities. If you're dealing with the development of new drugs in the current model that's divorced from patient-specific issues, those still are the crown jewels of a company which is trying to develop a new product. So the issue is, how much do I care about that? How good is the security? And I'm longing to hear, 
our colleagues from uh, AWS, from DNA Nexus, who specifically exist to provide enhanced security levels, and Microsoft about this. So you do have to ensure you're doing that, and that might be an argument for some people to say, no, we'll retreat and buy hardware inside our own firewall, but I could suggest that we already know pharma companies' firewalls are not 100% uh, secure. They're already known to be penetrated, so it's not a black and white thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd say something about crypto. As Peter Lee said, there's different levels of security required for different types of data. What we do in you know, designing new molecules is a fairly low level of security as opposed to patient data. But what we have tried to sort of capture uh, a detail from, in this case, Belgian food consuming countries. And uh, we basically hit the wall when we One statistic that, that, that I have. But we run the, the IT infrastructure for the Olympics, and the Rio Olympic, which just happened last year, was the first Olympic to run entirely in the cloud. And during two weeks, there were 512 million cybersecurity incidents taxed on the Olympic infrastructure. Not one of them got through to, into the most high profile you know, event ever, in terms of TV coverage and so on. So that was a really great thing, first of all, to, to run an event like that entirely in the cloud and as a, um, a to, to, you know, show the credibility of security in the cloud today, I can see for perhaps a few years ago. You can see one up there. I think it's maybe one of that this long discussion session that we got on On the fidelity thing, so that you made it sound we did a lot of work on design optimization for all the web app engines and app apps and similar to this idea of using multi fidelity simulations so that you think you're building a proper uh, design experiment parameters so you can then build a response to it that has the uncertainty built in and use low fidelity models in areas of low gradient and then higher fidelity options and make a human response that is within a bounded uncertainty. Um, and so there are methods So let's finish it out with a good answer. So the final speaker at this session is Herman von Weidmann. Weidmann, yeah. Weidmann. So he's going to talk about SCCD for free energy calculations at Yansa. All right, can I use uh, my stick here somewhere? Yeah. Uh, no, I think it was here, right? Mm, or I can just use my laptop. Yeah, okay. Do you know where he could put his stick? Because he wanted to run it from there. I have a laptop as well, just, although I don't have this connection on my laptop. You have a, you have a ah, you HDMI have, to view If you have that, yeah, that's fine. He'll use his video um, connector there. Ah, 
No, I don't have that connector. <laughs> Unfortunately, I do have. Uh, <laughs> okay. I hope this will work. <laughs> Looks like this is the first time. <laughs> otherwise, otherwise I could use yours. Yeah, <laughs> 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 All right, yeah, we'll do it via the laptop anyway. There we go. <laughs> My presentation was not half an hour, so I'll we'll make, we'll make it in time for coffee. Things that we had upstairs. <laughs> oh, it's not, it's not, it's not. Mm. It's where the Windows updates try and apply. <laughs> Unbelievable. <laughs> could have done Only this from the start. Seven. <laughs> <laughs> we could have done this from the start. Okay. All right. Well, I'd like to thank the uh, organizers for uh, giving me the opportunity to talk here. I'm going to give a bit of a perspective from a, from a pharma company on the value um, of uh, here. Uh, the value of these kinds of calculations for what we do and a bit of our experiences in, uh, in actually applying it. 
Now, uh, this is a very short presentation. I'm actually not going to give you too many results. I'm just going to talk to you about why these calculations are important, give a few, just a few results, but also some thinking about what kinds of uh, high performance computing solutions uh, we, uh, are, are most relevant to us. So uh, I work at Janssen, which is, a, which is basically the name for all the pharmaceutical activities of Johnson & Johnson, which is, as you know, a worldwide uh, health company, healthcare company. Um, and as uh, Peter already mentioned, uh, although it you know, goes by different names, um, there is this uh, uh, method, uh, it's, uh, well, it's one implementation of it is called free energy perturbation, there's something else that's called thermodynamic integration, but it's basically a rigorous method to calculate the free energy of binding difference between different ligands binding to a particular target, usually a protein. And uh, this is a somewhat more colorful picture of the same thing that, that Peter already showed. And it, it, it basically uh, it, it goes to the point that it's, 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 it's really based on statistical me uh, mechanics. It's a rigorous method uh, in which ligands are chemically transformed into one another, both inside the protein and, and in solution, and the result out of that, you can actually really get the free energy difference of binding between compound A and compound B. Whereas the direct uh, path of just actually taking your small molecule here and letting it bind to the protein to actually calculate that is, is, is uh, has so much error involved that it's, it's really much, much more complicated, much more difficult to get even a reasonable value. Why do we need it? So this is really, okay, this is all nice, and you could say this, this method has been around, actually the, the whole concept was, was, was out there in the, I think the 30s, in the 20th century. People have been running these calculations since the 80s as well. Uh, but uh, it, it hasn't really been very practical, and I'll get to that. But why do we need it? Um, so I'm heading a computational chemistry group at Janssen, so we do this all day. We do uh, molecular design all day, try to predict what the activity will be of um, a, a compound that hasn't been made yet, and try to come up with the next best compound to make, uh, to speed up uh, drug discovery. So we, and we actually we do need ways to better predict these, uh, these affinities, because actually not, we're not good at that. We're really not good at that. Even though some people might say that they are good at it, they're not. Uh, it will actually change how computational chemistry impacts compound optimization. If we had a much better uh, uh, trust in, in, in the predictions that we make, with maybe even a confidence interval, you can actually start making uh, suggestions to, 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 to chemists that are uh, maybe you know, not very uh, straightforward. Uh, so, well, first of all, if your predictions are better, obviously a higher percentage of compounds that are actually synthesized will have good affinity. Um, but also, uh, when I say better compounds, if you're more, more certain about your predictions, you have, just have a lot more, uh, you know, I mean, there's much more reasons for chemists to actually make something that they don't really like to make because it's more difficult synthetically. And this is usually what we run into. Chemists will usually make the things that they can make relatively easily. And we're not certain enough of our predictions that we can say, no, you should spend two months making this compound instead of two weeks making that one. And that will be a major difference, I think, if, if we can get these better predictions. Um, the other one, and, and Peter also referred to this, is there's this whole, of course, there's many statistical methods of also predicting compound activity, which are inference, inferencing methods, which are only good at interpolation uh, between already known compounds. But we need to go outside of what we have already done. So if you want to do that, you need to go back to you know, the physics that underlies the binding method. Otherwise, because you don't have any examples in the space where you, you know, want to look for a molecule. And the last thing to notice here is that it's actually important in all phases of optimizing, optimizing compounds. You know, we have these names for the different phases where hit to lead is where you have your initial hits, micromolar hits that you try to make get to higher affinity, let's say low nanomolar uh, binding affinity. Uh, but also later on in lead optimization where there's other aspects that become very important like maybe uh, acne properties, so the pharmacokinetics or even toxicology. 
even in this phase, uh, you do want to make sure that the changes you make are not negatively impacting your affinity, because affinity remains a very important property of your molecule. So being able to predict that is, is really important from the start, where you have your first bit, all the way to the point where you say, well, now we have a molecule that we want to prepare for to go to the clinic. And, and so if we can do that better, we can do it faster, this has a major impact. Um, but it is hard if you, if you want to do this because it's a very complex you know, event that you're trying to, 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 to predict. Uh, there's these systems, as you know, they're very flexible. So there's protein and ligand conformational changes when a, when a ligand binds to the protein. There's solvent everywhere and solvent rearranges itself with all kinds of, of, of energetic, uh, entropic and enthalpic uh, 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 effects. There is this thing called entropy-entropy compensation, where if you start binding to something more strongly, you immediately also make the system, uh, uh, in many cases, a bit more rigid, which then we lose this entropy, which is just counterbalancing what you just tried to do in terms of free energy. So this is something where you, you cannot just, by looking at a system or doing a simple calculation, see which one of the two will win out in, 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 this, uh, in, in, this, in this effect. And then there's, of course, electronic or quantum effects that we're not going to talk about today, but these are, these are important and they can also have a big impact. What are we doing? Uh, and this is just uh, definitely uh, 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 what we're doing today. I mean, there's lots, lots happening, so I think this might be a different slide uh, a year from now. But what we're doing today is we have a license to uh, a company is called Schrodinger, has a, a, a workflow, uh, uh, it's called FEP Plus. And free energy perturbation plus, which is based on the Desmond molecular dynamics engine, um, which we are using quite extensively uh, uh, today. Uh, we also are exploring the use of other MD engines. Uh, you know, MD is one that, that Peter already mentioned. He also mentioned Amber, and also mentioned Bromax. There's another one called OpenMX. So these are all other MD engines that are also developing their free energy perturbation and thermodynamic perturbation methodologies. Uh, we are working with Peter, either, you know, actually we did it independently, but also within the ComBioMed project uh, on, on his thermodynamic integration methods that we already mentioned, but also on his ASMAX method, which is, has been with the continuum uh, electrostatics. We also do some of that internally uh, in a different tool that we developed ourselves. What we have is hardware, this is sort of where it gets more of a it's, it's high performance computing uh, link, is we did by two 48 GPU clusters of, of NVIDIA. It's mostly k We do have some K20s in there. So there's one in Belgium of 48 and one in the US of 48. And that's what we use because the FTP Plus software has been optimized to run on, on GPUs and it actually performs quite well on that. We do have access to a virtual private AWS cloud, which now also has NVIDIA K80s, where you know access is basically it's not unlimited, but it's, it's, it's a fair number of K80s that you, you can access that way. And of course, we are exploring options with supercomputing centers via ComBioMed, but we're also doing that. We did that before, um, uh, just to see well, you know, what's what's you know, what's the most. Basically, we're exploring. You know, what's the best way for us to do this? Uh, collaborations. Well, we obviously work with the Schrodinger scientists. We also work with Peter. Uh, we have some other funded projects uh, to look at specific targets, but in most of these, in, in all of these collaborations, free energy calculations are, are quite central. So we're, we're active in this area. And we're currently doing a large scale uh, perspective calculation of around a thousand compounds. So that's, that's quite a large number. I mean, remember Peter in his presentation talked about he, some of the stats he showed were, I think, for 25 or 30 compounds or something like that. Thousand compounds, you can. That's that's quite a lot, and, and so for that, we're, we're we're currently doing that now on, on the GPUs on, that are available at uh, AWS. Combiomet is the, the project, obviously, that we're a uh, partner in. What are we planning to do within that project? Uh, we have a postdoc that will start uh, in a couple of months, and uh, basically, you know. I mean, get a little bit to that, but the, the focus still is the, the postdoc obviously needs to do develop uh, uh, methodology or really understand uh, 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 things or to develop science uh, and not just run calculations from an already standardized workflow. 
Um, so uh, we're really uh, interested in, in, in seeing how these methods do on, you know, really cases that are not really predictable with any other methods. You know, there are these things like activity cliff where you make a very small change in the molecule has a major effect on the free energy binding. Why is that? Quite often you just don't know it by, by looking at it. But in principle, free energy calculations could predict that. Uh, cases where you see major solvent rearrangements when you, when you change the ligand a little bit, or uh, these large differences in entropy and enthalpy of binding that we sometimes see in systems. These are things that, again, we cannot predict in any other way, and we're very interested in being able to predict those. And uh, that requires you know, quite a bit of uh, computation, and, and, and I think the ComBioMed project is, is with, with all the HPCs in there, is, 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 a, is a perfect way of, of, of really doing the science to, to, to bring the science forward there. Um, and then obviously also cases where the free energy predictions are really bad. They, those exist, you know, it's not always, it doesn't always work. Uh, Peter's way of actually averaging over five uh, uh, or more uh, different uh, initial velocities is already a major step because you can see what the, the variability is. Uh, but sometimes even, you know, just, just don't get it right. Why is that? And we would really like to understand that because it will improve the method. And then, of course, take a look at other uh, methodologies. So this is just, these are just two slides that, that, that show you what, what's the realistic case. So this was a case in a, in a, a phosphate asteroid too, which was an internal project, it is an internal target. Uh, and this is uh, for a number of, of, of compounds, uh, actually the kinds of correlation that we got, uh, which you can argue, well, is this good enough? It uh, actually is good enough uh, to actually do something with that's, that, that's, that's highly uh, productive in, in drug discovery because our next best method that we had uh, to, to do this, and was, which was at the, a highly optimized docking score that we had developed over quite a while, was this. So this, this basically tells you, and this is more or less the reality of trying to predict the affinity of compounds in a lead optimization uh, state, state where you're making small changes to the molecule and say, well, how much would this, what would the difference be if I would add a methyl or if I add a chlorine in this position? This is the kind of correlation that you can expect from most predictions, which is basically no correlation. So this is why I'm saying we're not good at this. We really aren't good at this, and we need this, these free energy methods to do this. So, what do you need? Uh, some of these numbers may not be completely accurate, but I think it's in the right ballpark. So, a typical transformation between two compounds, and this is just a, a graph that you get if you use the Ferdinand software, that basically where all, every, every box here is a compound, and then every link is a transformation that you do from one to the other, which is one of these, uh, which is basically the, the basis of the, the free energy perturbation method. Uh, a typical transformation, uh, you know, the system basically involves more than 10,000 atoms, and you need to do more than 10 million time steps. And this basically already, in, and these are all atoms that are interacting via fairly complicated uh, uh, potential energy functions. So this kind of gives you an idea why uh, you need these high, uh, a lot of computation to, to, to get this. Um, on top of that, you know, it's, it's actually to, to basically get improve the consistency. There's a couple of things you can do. One is what Peter is doing, uh, uh, which, which is described in this paper, where you, you, you use different initial velocities just to get a sense of you know what's what's the variability here. Another one, and uh, ideally it should be both of them, is to uh, make a lot of different transformations between compounds. It's not just saying, well, I'm gonna. I'm going to assume that I'm going to read off my affinity for this compound by just making the change from this compound. No, I'm also going to make the change from other compounds. And because free energy is a state function, in theory, uh, uh, if I take this path, the number should be the same as if I, I would take this path or go by a few other compounds. So that's sort of an other type of averaging. And we have definitely seen that internal consistency improves when you use that type of averaging as well. But it means that you have to do multiple transformations <coughs> for a compound, not one, but, but let's say three or more if you uh, want to even do that better. Uh, so if we use the Schrodinger's FEP software, uh, FEP plus software, 
it, it takes about 24 GPU hours for one compound transformation. Um, which means that on our GPUs that we have right now at Janssen, we can do about 30 compounds per day. That sort of uh, ballpark number. If you look at the, 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 the Thai software that was described in, in this recent paper here, uh, which I think that that's the work that was done uh, at, at Archer, um, uh, it took about eight hours on 6,200 cores per compound transformation. So what that means is you can do about, I guess it's not exactly right, but it's in the same order of magnitude is correct, I think 20 compounds per day on all of Archer. So, uh, you know, this gives a bit of a, of a comparison. So 100 of the GPUs that we have um, uh, give us 30, there's 20 on Archer that you can do on a day. I must say that in this particular paper, we did a five-fold sampling. So we, did, we basically did five times as many uh, uh, transformations than, than we did. So, you know, as I said, these numbers are not directly comparable, but I think the whole part is correct. So real life discovery compounds, as I already mentioned, the thousand compounds that we are already now exploring in our, in our simulation. Uh, this is more realistic, so 150 compounds. Because this, the reality is, okay, you're in this project, you, uh, the chemists are asking, well, what compound do I make next? I have all these ideas, but uh, I don't know which one will be best. And you know, unless we do this, we don't know either. I mean, we can do this the interpolation that works, but if we want to have some really different chemistry, we have to use these methods. But then 20, 30 compounds, between 20, 30 compounds a day, that's not really you know, the level that you need. You need to actually be able to do much more. And so, uh, for instance, this is just, <coughs> if you ask any chemist in that PEE2 project, you know, what are the things that you could make right now that you have in mind, you easily come up with 150 compounds. And this is one project. We have 25 projects going on at any given time. So you really need more competition to deal with that. And you know, uh, currently we are actually also this for one project. We're exploring this uh, these over a thousand compound proposals, which is actually quite reasonable, you know, a, a number to have. Um, and then on top of that, you would have an, an ideal turnaround time for these calculations to be less than two weeks. As I said, the, the analogy of the weather forecast. If I predict this in two months, the chemists have already started with the whole synthesis plan. It doesn't, it doesn't work out. Two weeks is quite reasonable. You know, if we can work, work on something for two weeks, you know, they can they can sort of think about what, how they will do the synthesis, and, and they will wait for that. If it's more than that, they won't wait for it, and you can only do some partial. You can only have a partial impact. So how, yeah, how realistic is this? So as I said, these are the numbers that we can do. Uh, today, either on the GPUs or on a system like Archer. Uh, if you look at the cost, so this is just uh, you know, take it straight from the, from the AWS uh, uh, cloud. Uh, so if, if you, let's say, 96 GPUs, let's say that's about 100, cost that, uh, which means $800,000 per year for us to do that. And what can we do with that? We can then do 30 compounds a day. That, that would be Purely the cost of the compute power. It doesn't even include the licensing costs that we also have to pay, but let's say just focus on the compute power. And 30 compounds a day, I would say it's reasonable for average demand today, but as I just said, if we can actually make these predictions work, and it, it will generate a much higher demand, and, and it will actually change the way we do the drug discovery by making it more compute centric, then 30 compounds a day is not going to be enough, definitely not enough for. The whole company, you know, for I mean, it'd be maybe enough for a couple of scientists, but not for the whole company. Because then also at peak times, you, you want to do these, these higher numbers and then do that within two weeks. So for that, you would need four to eight archers available to you, or you would need this level of uh, GPUs. And you can already see you know, that's that's actually quite expensive. Uh, like that. Actually, it's my last slide. So. So uh, about the method, I, just, I don't have to explain further, more, uh, further that this is actually a very important thing for us if we can make this work in a you know in, in, in the right uh, amount of time. Um, we have already used it in a number of projects. I just showed two here that we published on, but there's, there's many more that we're currently moving on. 
Um, I do think that further development of the methods, the workflows, the protocols is necessary, and this is what you know we're really interested in within the Combiomet project. Uh, right now, it's kind of limited by our cost-benefit balance. You know, there's actually quite a few pharma companies that have not stepped into this because they say, well, it's not yet accurate enough for the cost and the effort that we have to go through. So we have stepped into it, but we realize that it's not, it's definitely not an easy sell to make this with the current level of prediction and the current level of cost. So it, this needs to improve. And, uh, well, part of it, Part of the improvement will, of course, be that the deep cost will continue to drop, so that will help us very much so. Especially if we can use more GPUs, I think it's, it's probably be a, a cheaper um, option uh, than uh, using the, the standard cores. Um, and also the, the, you know, the, the, the methods that will improve will make, it, uh, will make that cost-benefit uh, balance also, also better. Uh, but this is where we stand today, and uh, I think this is the last slide. And yeah, this is just the, uh, you know, just the tables from the AWS cost that where I got the uh, the numbers from for uh, for uh, you know, the, the, the GPUs. So uh, with that, thank you for your attention. <laughs>
Yeah. You, could, you could decimate oh, yeah. the candidate. And we're doing that, but we, we have... Scandals were clearly toxic or yeah. clearly yeah. not important. Or things that, 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 are, that, that will not... It, it, it all depends what, where your bottleneck is. I mean, so, and the tools that we have now for, for doing pharmacokinetics, they're, I know, they're very basic, and they're not very good, but they, they, they provide some value. But they're much, much faster than, than this. So we, we, we filter it with those methods first before we do anything as expensive as this. But that might change if you have a much better uh, method to calculate the pharmacokinetics of a compound. But it is compute intensive. Then it depends on what, you know, what's what's the you know, where where is the bottleneck in the calculation, and that's the one that you would do last. You would do that first. Right? How do we can continue the discussion? Okay. Yeah, sure. Right, so thanks ever so much. Okay. Thanks to all the speakers for keeping the We're going to go for coffee. Could we ask people to be back here for eleven fifty five? I work with him, and he is interested in parallel in time. I don't know what that means, parallel in time. Parallel in time means if you simulate a, a, a system for a week, you chop it into slices, say each slice of a day or an hour, uh -huh. and you run them in parallel. But how do you know your initial conditions for further down? Well, there are techniques for that. Okay. Yeah, and they're, they're also what you guess, and then then you compare it to the. The idea is you first do everything in very rough resolution, and then you have iterations where you iteratively refine it. <laughs> Sorry, Dave. No, I, anyway, I'm running out of battery. I've got a yeah, no, yeah. you too. So oh, yeah. Fair enough. <laughs> well, I'm on next, so. <laughs> yeah, definitely priority. Thank you. God bless. Anyway, yeah. So. Uh, I, uh, I'm, I'm working on that one. So. Cool, yeah, that's good. Anyway, I won't just distract you, you probably have to. Uh, oh, I just got to get coffee, <laughs> coffee and cake is all I need, I think. You want me to get you a coffee? No, no, I just uh, got to plug myself in and I can, I can do it myself. Thank you. Then. I'll see you around then. Yes, yes, I'm here all day. Okay, you do. I've stolen the only spare one, sorry, and my laptop is very low on. Yeah, yeah that's why I guess more people are suffering. Yeah. Oh, there is one. Ah. ah, that's the same. You know, you might know there is something in there, and I don't get it. Either. It's just just I don't work. <laughs> You know what? I was looking for some power. There's also oh, some in the back. Where are the now that's what he needs I, for his presentation. I've stolen it. Oh, okay. My laptop's nearly dead. Because the other ones all have these. There is something in there. Something in Europe. Europe. Something in Europe.
Really? She sticks a that screwdriver. She sticks a screwdriver into the plug, into the top one, and then no. sticks a I'm not sure if that is safety or Yes. As long as really? I'm out of the room when she's doing it, it works <laughs> absolutely fine. Right. Oh, I like to draw a picture.
Yeah, can I just test this? Yes, can I just test this? Yeah. 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 Do you need a little? Oh, I think it just. Oh, I think it just. 